Hi, so um, we do have a few questions here. Um, let me start with some of the sleep questions. Uh, do you use wearable devices for patients to monitor their sleep patterns? I guess that would be for Dr. Something. Hi, uh, yeah, we, you know, we, we sometimes do. Uh, so we will sometimes order what's called actigraphy, which is uh, essentially kind of like a watch-like device worn on the wrist. It measures movement and can help to sort of track sleep versus wake behavior. Um, but something else that happens more and more is that patients are coming to us with their own wearables uh, and their own wearable data. It's becoming more and more common that uh, whether it's an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or whatever, uh, patients will be uh, kind of monitoring and tracking their own sleep with, with these kinds of devices. And um, uh, in, in some cases, I think that can be useful and we, and, and we look at it, although I think there are other cases where we um, kind of encourage patients to go a little bit more by how they feel and not get too uh, uh, into the, the, the data from their device because sometimes that can um, be a little distracting. Thank you. And then um, another sleep question, for sleep disorders, do you, find act, do you actually find that there's an increase in sleep dysregulation in long COVID patients? i.e. do you believe there's an actual neurologic change that's leading to dis disordered sleep patterns that's a result of long COVID? Uh, Dr. Something, I don't know if you can answer that or possibly. Sure. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I think is the best answer that I can give. We certainly see sort of the end result, which is plenty of sleep problems in the context of long COVID, but whether this is kind of directly kind of neurologically mediated or maybe kind of a result of some of the other uh, symptoms uh, that, that can result from long COVID, uh, that much is unclear, but I think there's a lot of interest in kind of trying to unravel some of these answers. I think it's a great question. Okay. Dr. Simpson, did you have anything to add to that before we move on to other questions with Dr. Preston? Um, no, I agree with that. I think that um, the evidence we have now doesn't necessarily point to a separate etiologic process, but, you know, as Dr. Sumping pointed out, you know, we're really looking at farther downstream outputs. And so it's difficult to say if there's something far upstream um, that's changing things. All right, and then we have some questions regarding uh, vaccines for Dr. Schaefer. Uh, we have quite a few. Um, first, is there a continued added benefit from repeat vaccination in preventing long COVID or does the benefit plateau after a certain number of COVID vaccines have been received? Um, so my video is not uh, working, let's see. Yeah, I'm being... I'm, it says, okay, I can start the video now. No, it's not, okay. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the basic idea is that the less severe, the less virus you have replicating during your uh, in, uh, either acute infection or reinfection, the less likely you're going to have complications later on. So although there hasn't been much study of the incremental added value of each vaccine, I think the general principle is that if you uh, as if your immunity as is that is as good as possible, then that's the best way to prevent not only the infection, but long COVID should you become infected. So that's an extrapolation from from the data that it are available. Thank you. And then we've also had a few questions about Novavax versus the mRNA vaccines. Um, would you suggest Novavax for patients with long COVID who had severe exacerbation in their symptoms for two to six months after Moderna vaccines? Yeah, so having uh, symptoms for two to six months after uh, uh, an mRNA vaccine you know, that's pretty uh, uh, extreme and pretty unusual. But if somebody did have such severe symptoms and did did believe or provide uh, 
sort of evidence that that the vaccine was responsible for their symptoms, then I, I do recommend Novavax since in at least one study, there have been less, fewer symptoms compared to uh, uh, mRNA vaccines with Novavax. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Eggert, um, we've had a few questions about hyperbaric oxygen treatment. And let's see here. Um, they say, I had a question about hyperbaric ox oxygen therapy and gave uh, um, a reference to an article. Um, they're wondering if ex uh, exertional fatigue and shortness of breath uh, and tachycardia could be resolved act after hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That is very interesting. I will have to look at that reference. It's not something that I have heard or have commonly used in my practice, but it definitely sounds very interesting and um, very happy to look into it and circle back at a future time. I don't know if anybody else has used hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I don't think there's very many people that have, but I don't know. Um, okay. And then let's go ahead. Um, Let's just see here. Uh, this is a question um, possibly for Dr. Egbert also, or anyone. Um, how do you prevent further de deconditioning in patients with severe post-exertional malaise who feel like they're gonna crash after doing simple ADLs? What sort of graded exercise is optimal for them? Ooh, this is difficult. So, you know, my general recommendations for patients with graded exercise and improving conditioning and all that is generally not in those patients who have very, very severe, um, you know, ADL limiting PEM. I mean, it just, that's a, a different kind of situation. And in those kind of situations, I think energy conservation is more important. Um, and I kind of defer those recommendations to my colleagues like the fabulous Dr. Bonilla, who really specializes in this area. Yeah, and with Dr. Bonilla's comment, I think that'll be our last, uh, just so we can keep our to our wrap up and adjourn at one. Thank you, Doctor. Or thank you, everybody. But um, Dr. Bonilla, want the like, last comment? I think my video is not working, but it's just kind of I block. But um, okay, now let's see. Is it working? Yeah. So uh, the uh, I think as I agree with Lauren, what you say, energy conservation is very very important because those patients have a limit of energy. And I try to uh, tell the patient the analogy of a car or a gas tank. Um, before the people get this illness, they're driving a car with a 40 gallon gas tank. They can drive in the Bay Area everywhere that they can go miles and miles without any problem. But those people, uh, something happened and the gas tank getting shrink. Maybe from 40 gallons went to four gallons and they had to leave with a four gallon, they have to adjust their life to the four gallons gas tank. And people need to be considered that can, we need energy to make your brain work. When you're thinking, when you're talking, when you listen to music, when you read an email, when you are having a conversation, your brain work and they spend energy. Energy, the brain can spend maybe around 20 to 30% of the total energy that you have. The other thing is stress. When you have stress, you activate the whole inflammatory responses and immune system. It spend a lot of energy. And when you both, you use energy to move your muscles. So this energy used in those kind of situations. So it's very important when you having a, a limit gas tank to look at your dashboard, look at the indicators that when the energy is going down. Uh, these symptoms, I call the warning symptoms. This kind of warning symptoms it's very important people, they can look at it and they can say, it's time for me to go to a gas station. And we go to a gas station, be sure you turn off the engine. People go and rest and watching TV, go and rest with the cell phone, checking emails or, or testing or reading in the media, what's in the media. They need to stop doing things, just rest them for half an hour, one hour, whatever they need it. And they keep on driving their car, but always paying attention to the dashboard to look at to the warning symptoms. In this way, the people, they can do whatever they want, but always look at what they have. I don't recommend a specific exercise program because everybody has different gas tank. Some people have a small, some people have a 
middle size, and people have a full gas tank. So we cannot recommend the same kind of program for every single patient. Every patient is individual, and they need to people, they know their limits. This kind of uh, advice helps to my patients to do more activities. And some people, they do only pacing activities, and they improve my, my 20 to 30% of the, the, of the function they recover just only for doing the pacing. But it's very difficult in somebody who is very active before and they want to keep doing the same thing they are doing as, as before. Okay, I, I need to just keep silent now. Okay, thanks. Thank you.